Okay, well, good morning, everyone. Thanks for being here. Um, I do appreciate it. Um, today we're going to talk just about credit spreads and credit spreads alone. Just to kind of fill in some of those details that folks may have um, on credit spreads. And um, if you guys have any questions, please, you know, make sure you ask those questions. I want to try and answer those the best I can. I'm going to go over my rules and I'm going to talk about why they are my rules. Um, and a few other details about these credit spreads. And we'll take a look at, at um, the trading platform and the setup and those kind of things as well. So let's take off here and why, let's see if I can get this to work. First one I wanted to talk about was the bull put credit spread. Um, this is a bullish two leg strategy. And anytime I, and I'm talking options and use multiple legs, um, it makes the trade more complex. And it's something that everyone needs to think carefully about because it's really easy as a, um, you know, a novice in options to make mistakes on these trades. Even, even as someone that's done it for years and years and years, there's times when I have to pause and say, oh, wait a minute, that's backwards. Um, so make sure you take your time when you start putting these strategies together. And the way to do that, guys, is to, to really practice these. Once we kind of go through this, I really want to encourage you guys to go out on your paper trade system and trade them. And, and I mean, go around the market and place little trades all over the place in your paper trade system and watch and see how they act and work. Because I can tell you guys that the credit spread strategy was really, really good for me and growing my account when I was busy and I couldn't watch the market very much, it just did a lot for me in, in growing my account. So. The thing about the credit spread strategy is um, a lot of folks don't don't th understand it very well, and they they get kind of confused by it and wonder why anyone one would want to trade them because it is a strategy that has a limited profit potential and a limited loss. The thing is, though, the profit potential is less than the maximum loss. Okay, so. Folks will go, now why would I ever want to trade that if I could lose more money than I could make? Well, there's specific reasons why the credit spread strategy is um, useful. It's not for everyone, but it's one of those that um, is nice to have as a tool. <laughs> oh, I apologize, guys, for the sneeze. I couldn't get the mic shut off soon enough. I have those allergies kicking up this time of year. <laughs> Thank you, Lauren. Thank you. So um, it involves selling an option and buying a put option that's further away from the short and creating what they call the spread. The strategy is often referred to as a vertical put spread um, due to the graphical layout. When you lay it out on a P&L chart, it's vertical. And so because of that graphical layout, it's how it got, it's got its name as um, a vertical spread. And it's intended to take advantage of theta decay. Um, we all know that options decay toward expiration and the credit spreads are designed to take advantage of that. Um, the put credit spread, um, when you construct these correctly, and when I say correctly, it's, I'm, I'm actually inferring the way I do them. <laughs> but um, you use good technical analysis to do it because um, you can't just place these trades anywhere in the market or in any position in the chart and expect a high outcome of return. 
But if you place them correctly, you have a high probability of success in these, about 70% or even better on the success rate of these. And they have a relatively high return on invested capital. Like your actual inv invested capital is um, relatively high. So you get about a 30% or more even in the potential profit on these trades. So one of the things to remember in the, the credit spreads and bull put and, and, and bear call the same are the limited risk, limited reward of the strategy. Okay, any questions on any of that? Not seeing any, so I'm going to move along. When we look at the construction of a uh, bull put credit spread, um, <clears throat> they're actually quite simple, but it's so easy to get them messed up um, when you're looking at them. And does anyone in here ever have trouble with the PL charts? PL charts sometimes, some people look at them and they go, that just makes sense. Some people look at them and say, boy, I don't get what the heck that thing is saying. <laughs> I see we have a mix of that in here. So let's talk about the construction of these. <clears throat> so what we're gonna do on a bull put credit spread is um, in any P&L chart, you're going to have price increasing in this direction, okay? Price goes up in this direction price goes down in this direction, okay? So we move up in price as we go to the right and we go lower in price as we move to the left, all right? So what this is saying in here on the bull put <clears throat> is we want, to, um, we want to take advantage of a bullish situation in the chart. Now, a lot of people will say that credit spreads don't really have, they're more of a neutral strategy, and they are. They're a neutral strategy, much more neutral than any directional trade. But they do have a, you need to have a, a bias on the direction of the trade. You need to have an expectation with the bull put credit spread of a bullish price move, okay? They can be profitable um, if, the, if the stock moves up. They can be profitable if the stock moves sideways, and they can even be profitable if there is a minimal pullback in the trade, depending on how they're set up. And we'll go over that as we go along here. But <clears throat> essentially what we're doing is we're selling one put option. Okay. We're selling one put option, and then we're buying a put option. Okay. Now our maximum profit is up here. Our maximum loss is here, okay? So any place where the stock falls below this break even point in the trade, we start moving into a loss, okay? Anything where the price stays above that break even point, we have the potential once we reach our um, strike here, we have the potential of the maximum gain, okay, in that trade. So one of the things that always seemed to confuse me initially when I was looking at these P&L charts is this break-even point. And break-even is really more important in these multi-leg strategies than it really is in just simple call and put directional trades. Okay, but you're always going to see on the bull put credit spread this profile. Okay, this profile right in here, your maximum loss will always be beyond that point of the short strike. Your maximum win will always be above that point, the long strike. And what this means is we've capped our losses. We can't lose any more than this. That's the maximum loss, and we can't make any more than this, okay? So we have capped losses and a capped um, upside as well, okay? So they're limited on both sides. Now, the way I trade these, 
and the rules that I follow, and we'll talk about why I do this, but the short strike, I want to sell that short strike somewhere near um, that 30 deltas out of the money. And the reason I do that, guys, is just the mathematics. Um, the mathematics of options works. And, you know, math works. Math doesn't lie. Price action can be manipulated, all kinds of things, but math typically doesn't lie. And when you're going to, well, not typically, it never lies. Um, so when you take a look at a 30 delta option, that means that that option has a 70% chance of expiring out of the money. It's already out of the money, and now it has a 70% chance of expiring out of the money based on the price action and how the options are being traded. Okay, the long strike, of course, is gonna be a little bit further out of the money. All right, so let's say we have the price action of a chart and we're looking at a price here. Let me draw up here. Stock has moved up, pulled back, starts up in that trade, okay? We have a trend that's working in our favor here. The construction of the bull put, we would want to have the short strike would be close to or relatively close to the um, to the current price. So our short strike might be right here and our long strike would be just a little bit further away from the price. And that's what creates the spread. The spread is determined by the strikes and the space between the strikes, okay? So if this is a 20 strike right here and this is a 21 strike, we have a $1 wide credit spread. Does that make sense? We have a $1 wide credit spread. Okay. If it's, and you'll see $2.50 credit spreads, you'll see $5 wide credit spreads, $10 wide credit spreads. Okay. Now the maximum profit in a credit spread is going to be the premium collected. Okay, so if we collect on this trade, if we collect, let's say we collect um, 33 cents, which is the perfect one third, right? The perfect one third. If we can collect 33 cents on this trade and the spread is $1, what's our maximum risk on the trade? <clears throat> 67 cents that's right 67 cents that's our maximum risk on the trade okay so in that position we can't lose more than 67 dollars on a single contract trade but our maximum profit is only $33. And there's the problem that people struggle with. Why would I take a trade that could lose me, you know, more than double of what my profit is? Okay. Well, the reason people like these trades is because the actual low risk. If you place a small trade like this, you know that your maximum risk is $67 in the trade. And by the way, we get that number Okay, by taking that $1 wide spread, subtracting our credit, and that equals our 67 cents in the trade. Okay, so whatever you collect on a credit spread, subtract your credit spread premium that you collect, okay, from your um, spread, and you're gonna have the, the maximum risk of the trade, okay? Uh, Tom, if it goes against you, how would you repair? There's a lot of ways that you can try to repair trades, but here's the thing, Tom. Um, the majority of time when people try to repair credit spreads, they just make the trade worse. I can show you some things that I can that I've learned to do that I can try to minimize the damage. Okay. 
but I usually cannot resolve the damage, okay? And the reason is because if price moves against you, and isn't it this the, the case, Tom, in everyone wants to take these complex trades and then try to figure out, be the smartest guy in the room and figure out a way that I can repair this trade so I can never lose money. Um, the fact of the matter is anytime you add additional trades, you're adding di additional risk to the trade. So here's the thing I would say. If you're wrong, wouldn't it be better, just like any directional trade, Tom? If you're in this as a directional trade here and that stock fails down through this support, is your directional assumption on this trade incorrect? Right, so your directional assumption would be incorrect. Probably the better thing to do at that point is just fess up to it and close this trade. Okay, because if you close it on the failure of the pattern, you lose very little money. You're not gonna take the max risk in this trade. So the better thing to do is if you're wrong, just be wrong. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Um, let's see. Uh, GP, yes, that's correct. Um, slow down on the questions here, guys. I, I won't be able to answer them all that quickly. Mike. If it is only one-fifth of the spread or less. Okay. Well, let's think about that for just a second. <clears throat> if, we, if we take this trade, okay, and the stock gaps against us, that can happen, right? A stock can just, we get something wild happen in the market and it gaps against us. We, we can be in a maximum loss on this trade like overnight. Okay. In that situation, how many how many of these trades, if you're making 33 or one third of the spread, how many of these trades will it take to recover a loss, a max loss? Yeah, two or three is all you need two or three is all you need okay but if you take a credit spread and this is where people get messed up in this and I'll tell you guys the biggest loss I ever took in my trading career was trading far out of the money credit spreads okay would you guys say that the market is relentless right now Relentlessly bullish. Okay. And if you traded a far out of the money credit spread, you could see yourself being absolutely backwards in that trade, right? So let's say you win a far out of the money and you only take about one fifth of the spread, which is 20 cents. You take a 20 cent credit on the trade and you're at a maximum loss. You lose. $80 on that trade. How many times do you have to be right just to get even? Right. So it requires us to have so many winning trades to recover one losing trade that it makes it very difficult to ever make money with credit spreads because we only have to be wrong once and it wipes out a whole bunch of winning trades. Does that make, your, make some sense to you? This trade would have about an 80% probability of winning, but it also is going to require an awful lot of accuracy. You have to be almost a perfect trader to make credit spreads like that work, because it's the one loss 
that just wipes out everything that you've done. <clears throat> so you could have months of winning trades, month after month after month of winning trades, and that one month takes all the profit away. Okay. <clears throat> uh, Bill, uh, maybe a silly question, but why is the risk $1 on a dollar widespread? How does that math work? Um, well, if we, it, it comes down to your rights and obligations, really. If, if you sell, if you sell a 20 strike contract, okay, what is the obligation on that? The obligation on that is that you are required to provide whoever bought that from you, you're required to give them the stock at $20 a share if they can exercise that chart or, or that exercise that trade. Meaning if the stock falls below 20, you owe somebody in the market 20 bucks or $20 share stock, okay? But if you in turn buy an option, okay, in this case would be a 19, if we buy a 19 strike option, what's our risk on this trade? Our risk on this trade is we're, we're obligated to provide someone the stock for $20, but someone else is obligated to provide for us the stock at $19. So the maximum risk on that trade is $1. That's how you create the spread. So this one, we have a right to buy the stock at 19. This one, we have an obligation to provide the stock at 20. Hope that answers your question. That's how you create the spread. Okay. And then in the premium that we collect, if we, the, the premium that we collect, if we happen to get that perfect 33 cents on the trade, this is our maximum profit, okay? And the remainder, the 67, is our maximum loss. Okay? And I may have missed some of your questions, but please ask them again. Um, they've already passed me by here quite a ways. Okay, so think about that um, when you're placing these trades. So, you know, there are, and let me just tell you this story quick. Um, using credit spreads, got involved with the service years and years ago. They made me believe that they had this all figured out. And, and I agreed they had this all figured out. And we were taking trades that had somewhere between 90 uh, around 90% to maybe about 85% probability of winning. So what we were normally doing is we were taking credit spreads that had 10 cents potential on a dollar wide spread up to about 14 cents. Okay. <clears throat> In credit. And you know, the only way you can make that work, guys, is you gotta trade a lot of contracts. Okay, if you're making 10 cents on a spread. Yeah, thank Karen the super trader. <laughs> a lot of people probably don't know who that is. But trading those way out of the money credit spreads and what ended up happening is we had that one relentless market like we have right now. And we had these giant positions, because the only way you can make much money doing these is trade large numbers of spreads. Okay? You know, you'd have to do a 10 contract spread just to make a hundred bucks here. So 10 contracts spared to make a hundred dollars, maximum loss is $900. Does that make sense to you? And when you get that one that goes against you, 
it wipes out months and months of progress. I mean, all at once, it just disappears. Okay. <clears throat> well, credit spreads, like I said in that first slide, are always going to be based on good technical analysis. We want that credit spread, as I said up here, we want that bull put credit spread to be constructed below a price support. Below a price support. Where we see that good pattern in there, if the stock does pull back, it bounces off of that price support and continues on higher. Uh, yeah, Nicholas. Yeah, for sure. If it's one of your first trades, it's a bad, bad situation when you're in that. You lose a lot of money real fast. Okay. Now, there's a lot of folks out there that, that try to convince everybody that, um, that the credit spread, the iron condor, boy, if you don't understand these, you don't know what you're doing with options. You have to be a net seller to be any kind of profitable in options. And the fact is, guys, it's just not true. Every strategy has a purpose and a reason. Okay? Every strategy has a specific way that you should be working to set them up. Why they make sense. Okay? So why would a credit spread make sense? Well, if you have a small trading account and you're trading a bullish stock, you can't afford to buy an Amazon or, or, or not even that, a, a Microsoft or something along those lines. But if the stock is bullish and trending, you can trade a credit spread and take advantage of that trend, okay? Without taking such large undue risk in the trade that it wouldn't make sense, okay? Where we're taking just such a big risk in the position. And if we're working through the math and if we're taking good quality trades and good quality trending stocks that are holding on to support levels and showing bullishness, then we can put on trades with a high probability of winning, okay? If we have that high probability of winning of around 70%, you do enough occurrences. What does the math tell you? If you do enough occurrences of something that has a 70% probability, what's going to happen? You're going to win about 70% of the trades if you're placing them correctly. Okay, that's why the credit spread strategy is such a good strategy. Okay. Because if they're done correctly with a good set of rules and guidelines, they can be a profitable strategy, a very profitable strategy. And they can be very, very helpful for um, taking trades that you think have overextended, but you don't have a real bullish or bearish um, um, signal to trade them. They can also be that where you can kind of do a little speculating without tremendous risk. Okay. Uh, George, do you suggest selling, setting stops for credit spreads? You certainly can set stops for credit spreads. And if you can't watch the market, I would suggest that you do that on every, every trade. Um, as you know, I am I'm a big believer that if you're if you can't sit there if you can't stay and watch the market you should have some kind of protection in the market okay and anytime you have um, are doing these you want to have that comfort level with your trading you never want to take one of these trades where it goes beyond your tolerance for risk okay and you never want to be taking one of these trades where you don't have a pretty good um, definition of where you'd want to be out of this trade if it moved against you. Okay.
do you care about IV rank at all? Greg, yes, you do. Now, one of the things that people like to tell you in credit spreads is that the time to trade those is when the implied volatility is hot high. Now, why is that? The reason that is the case is because when implied volatility is high, what happens to the extrinsic value of an option? It goes up in price, right? That means time value. Time value just went up in price. Why did it go up in price? It went up in price because there's more risk. Okay. So there's a delicate balance here. Implied volatility, high implied volatility gives you more potential profit in a trade, but it also gives you more risk in the trade. And that's something they don't tell you. They just say, oh, when the implied volatility is high, do credit spreads. That's, that's, where they, that's the money right there. Okay. Until it goes against you. Okay. So you have to be careful. It's a balancing act. Is there a perfect IV rank? No, there's not. It's really going to be based, and it's always going to be based, guys, on the price action of the chart. That's the most important factor. What is the chart doing? Okay. If we're good at reading price action and charts, we can trade credit spreads at any time, even when the volatility is low. As long as we get that one-third spread. Now, I'll tell you, when the volatility is low, it's sometimes difficult to find one-third credit spreads. You may have to sacrifice a little bit of your potential profit to get a credit spread. Okay. <clears throat> now, what I typically do, and you guys see me do this a lot, is if I lay out a credit spread, I often lay out also where I would want to be out of the trade if it moved against me. And I just usually place a line on the chart because I'm here to watch or, or a, an alert on the chart to warn me when I may be crossing through there. And typically, guys, I want it because I pr build these with a cushion in them, um, I want to see that price action close through that level, not just touch it, but to close through that level. Okay. Um, Nicholas, yes, uh, technical analysis is also going to help improve. In fact, I, like I just mentioned, your reading of the chart, okay, is going to do more for your success in trading than the strategy itself. Okay. A lot of folks don't want to tell you that. They just say, oh, you just got to do credit spreads and everything will be okay. No, that's not true. Every trade that you make, the importance is always going to be on the structure of the chart, the price action of the chart. So by doing good technical analysis, you increase your odds. You give yourself a little bit of an edge. Okay, and that is why we want to make sure that when we place credit spreads, we have a good viable reason for that. Uh, Mary says, and by the way, I want to welcome the, the Dallas uh, trading group here. Thanks for being here. Uh, Mary um, is saying, um, you say put a stop. On a spread, what brokerage firm allows you to place a stop on an option spread? Um, I place conditional order exits to close both sides of the trade all at once on Thinkorswim. I know you use Thinkorswim. Um, I close the entire trade when it reaches through a conditional um, area in the chart. So if I if I say Here's my price pattern. I have the stock moving up. I get a nice little bullish move. Trend is in my favor. And if I say right here, stock um, falls below here, the price of the stock falls below here, close my credit spread. 
So it's a conditional order based on the price of the stock, not the price of the options. IV ranking is available in TOS. Yes, it is. And by the way, Mary was probably asking that question for someone else in the in from the group. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mary. Mary, um, Mary runs the um, or manages. I wouldn't. I, I don't know what you call yourself. <laughs> uh, she is the organizer of the Dallas Fort Worth um, Option Trading Group, and um, also a member of of Right Way Options. So they're they're here today. <clears throat> Moderator, there you go. Um. Uh, David, how far do you set the short put away? You can set it away as far as you want. Um, just remember, it increases the risk, okay? If we sell that 20 strike contract, okay? So if we get that 20 strike contract that we sell and we buy an 18 contract, what's the risk on this trade now? Yeah, maximum risk in this trade is $2. So the farther you spread these out, the more risk there is in the trade. So consequently, the more we need to collect in premium to fit our rules. So you can go farther out. That's fine. You can keep moving that, that long strike further and further away that, as long as you can collect enough money to cover your maximum loss. Okay. So there's no hard and fast rule there. Just we want to make sure that we can cover those losses. We want to make sure that we're collecting enough in credit to make sense in the trade. Okay. So on the bull put credit spread, just to kind of cover up or summarize this, on the bull put credit spread, the maximum profit is defined, the maximum loss is defined. The maximum profit is going to be the premium you receive. So any premium you collect in the trade, that is your max profit on the trade. Your max loss is defined, but the maximum loss will be the width of the strikes minus the premium received. So if you have a $5 wide credit spread and you've collected a dollar in premium, what's your risk? What's your maximum loss in that trade? Four bucks, that's right. So you have a potential $400 loss in that position. And obviously, if we took that dollar wide credit spread, do we even come anywhere close to a one third credit spread? No. So that one loss, if we take that dollar wide credit spread, and people will do that. Well, it's $5, I'm gonna make 100 bucks, let's do that. But if it goes against them, if it gaps or moves real quickly against them, and they take a $400 loss, now they're in the situation where they have to be exactly right the next four times just to get even. Okay, so you wanna make sure and plan those trades carefully because we're no we know we're not always oh geez i ended up getting my cursor in there on that uh that image i don't know i clipped it from um from my um word and stuck it in here and ended up leaving the pointer in there so um what are they best for they're best for getting a long stock with limited risk so we're, we're able to trade long, we're able, able to trade a bullish trend, okay? But we can minimize our risk in the trade with the credit spread, okay? <clears throat> so you wanna use them when you believe the stock is bullish, okay? And you don't wanna do the directional risk of a just a directional call option. You believe it's bullish, it's going up, 
but the risk of a straight call option trade would be too expensive or too much risk. That's why you would consider a bull put spread. Now, obviously it has two legs in the trade. Okay. And the opposite side of this, and by the way, next week we're gonna talk about the put debit spread. Okay. Pros of this strategy. Stock moves up, it's a winner. Stock moves sideways, it's a winner. Stock only moves down slightly, still a winner. That's why people love these. Because they can be somewhat neutral in that aspect. If as long as you get a good credit and you place them correctly, the stock can really move in really freely in two of the directions that the market can go, up and sideways. And as long as it stays up and sideways and doesn't just move down too much, it's profitable. The cons of these trades, um, they can be slow to profit. You know, we can catch a trade that's just perfect. We get into that trade and it just shoots in our direction really, really quick. Volatility changes and we get our profit pretty fast. Okay. But in reality, most of the time, guys, we're not perfect on timing, are we? Anybody in here admit that you perfectly time everything in every trade? If you do, let me know. I got some money I'd like you to manage. <laughs> timing is very, very important in these. And if we don't have, um, if we're not hitting timing just perfectly in that direction, um, then um, these are slow to profit. And that's where people have trouble, another place they have trouble with, the, with credit spreads because they are boring. You can put on credit spreads and everything is going just exactly right, but you don't see much of any profit until the last 10 days of the credit spread. So they can be very, very slow to profit and people get bored with them really fast and they tend to want to micromanage them. And that's, that's a major no-no. Because remember, what we're working for is the top passage of time. That is this trade. It's a time trade. We can only make money as time passes toward expiration. Time has to go by. <clears throat> bear call spread and uptrend they can they can cause you trouble um, you can speculate with them once in a while you want to trade those small but um, you know let's say you're just saying I think this stock is really stretched out it should pull back kind of a thing and you take a credit spread that is more speculation in, in nature. And I would say if you're gonna do that, trade those really small. And you know, if you're right, great. It gives you a little hedge. If you're wrong, they can go get you quit. Yes, this is a theta strategy, Barry. You're working for theta. Okay, theta is your buddy in this. Okay, because, you know, let's say <clears throat> if you sell a contract, um, if you sell that 20 contract on that trade, okay, and that 20 contract is going to have, it's always going to have some extrinsic value, right? An out-of-the-money contract all the time. The only value an out-of-the-money contract has is the extrinsic value. The extrinsic value must be at zero at expiration. It can't be anything else. Okay. So what we're doing is we're waiting for the passage of time moving toward that zero. Okay. The one we buy down here we shorted this one, the one we buy is also going to be zero at expiration on its extrinsic value.
so the only money we can make is the difference between these two. Okay, it's what we collected in the premium that makes this strategy work. We know both of these are going to be at zero at expiration. And if there's enough premium in here to reach one third of the credit spread, then we have a trade that gives us a pretty good chance of making some decent money on the trade. But they're boring. And folks struggle with those. Now, I will tell you guys that I spent a lot of time when I was working full time building houses, couldn't watch the market. I traded a lot of credit spreads. Okay. But what I did is I kept the trades small. Another mistake that people make with credit spreads is they way overextend their risk. Okay, how many of you guys want to trade for $30 and have to wait a month to get it? And so what people will do is say, well, I need more money in that, so I'm going to trade this 10 times. I can make $300 doing that. Okay, but if you collected 30 cents on this, that means your risk on this trade is 700 bucks. Okay, that doesn't work out very well if one trade goes against you. Okay, so to make credit spreads work for me, what I did is I placed small credit spreads all over the market in all different sectors. I would find a little credit spread in energy you know, and I'd place a one or two contract trade. I'd find something in finance and I'd place a one or two contract trade. I'd find something in tech and I'd place a one or two contract trade. And I would put these trades all over the market, all different sectors, all different stocks, all over the place. And it was a lot of work, okay? And what I did is I used the math. I use the math. If, if I'm good at setting these up, if I set 10 trades, how many of those should I win? Just by nature of the math. I should have seven winning trades, right? Now you can have that month that goes bad, right? But most of the time you should have that higher proportion of winning trades just based on the math if you've done a good job of technical analysis. If you've done a good job of technical analysis. Okay? So what I would do to offset those three losses is I always wanted to have a little more of a cushion, a little more cushion in there. So I was usually placing somewhere between about 13 to 15 credit spreads every single month. Okay, and that means during some periods of the month, you have this many heading toward expiration and you need to add another 13 to 15 for the following month. So it's a lot of work. There's a lot of trades in here to make this work. But I can tell you this, guys, when I did this and you follow the math, it works you're gonna win about 70% of those trades and you're gonna grow your account. But it's slow and it's not very exciting. It's boring to do, but it can work very effectively if you plan carefully. Okay? Small trades all over the market where you didn't have one specific area going against you all at once. And that's where people make mistakes on these. They overload in one place. They don't want to work that hard. They don't want to find that many trades. So I'm just going to load it all up here. I need to make all my money on one trade. If that thing goes wrong, you're in trouble right off the bat. So people make those mistakes in these trades all the time. And it creates all kinds of problems and havoc in their trading. Okay. So we shouldn't have to spend quite as much time on the bear call credit spread. Um,
because we've kind of explained a lot of these concepts, but the bear call credit spread is the same. It's a, it's a neutral, bull, bearish to neutral two leg strategy. It has limited profit, limited loss. You're selling one that's somewhere near the, nearer the money than the one that you're buying. Okay, creating that spread. Um, they're called vertical call spreads a lot. You'll hear hear that. And um, once again, if they're set up correctly, and in this case, set up correctly above a price resistance level in the chart, you have a high probability in these trades. Okay? The construction of these trades is just using call options versus put options, okay? Call options, you're going to sell one short strike, you're gonna buy one long strike in that trade. Your max profit is gonna be up here. Your max loss is gonna be down here, okay? Your break even right there in the center and then and your break even is always, they. Sh this shows as a center. It's not truly center because remember, if you take that dollar wide credit spread and get 33 cents, your break even point is when you cross down below that credit of 33 cents. So you actually have bigger risk down here than you can potential gain. Okay. And once again, we're trying to uh, sell that short strike near that 30 deltas out of the money. We're going to be a little bit further out on the long strike. And by the way, I didn't spend too much time on this, and I need to. Um, this is pretty important to me. Um, one of my rules is that I try to start looking for credit spreads somewhere around 45 days to expiration. You can go a little bit longer from time to time, up around 50 days, whatever the market is doing. But I try to have all of my credit spreads in place before that 30 days to expiration. Now I'll tell you, it is possible. It is possible to get one third credit spreads on some bigger stocks all the way into like 20 days to expiration. Okay, but it usually means that they've had a burst of volatility for some reason. There's been an explosion of volatility, spiked up that extrinsic value of the options, and it gives you an opportunity to go shorter time on those credit spreads and still collect that one third. Now, I will tell you guys, if you, on a normal basis, on a normal basis, anytime you cross down less than 30 days, into ex toward expiration, you will find it difficult to nearly impossible to find one third credit spreads without a burst of volatility. Okay, it's difficult, it's hard. So you have to have a set of rules, okay? I always want on a dollar wide credit spread, I wanna get a minimum of 30 cents. I don't wanna go lower than that ever. If I can get 33, 34, 35, you guys have seen me in um, uh, the volatility actually get a dollar wide spread that had 43 cents. But you really have to look hard for them and be taking advantage of an explosive move in volatility. Okay? So you have to watch that close. And I'm always working in those positions. Now, people ask me all the time, well, can't you take an in-the-money credit spread? Yes, you can. You can take in-the-money credit spreads and, and at-the-money credit spreads. But I got to tell you guys, I've never seen anybody um, have any kind of ratio. When you take a at-the-money credit spread, you're selling the, the option at the money. It's a 50-50 trade at best. And I don't know about you, but I want to have better odds than 50-50. Okay? If you do an in-the-money credit spread, you run the risk of assignment. Okay? The advantage to that is that you probably collected more credit, but you're going to have a very, very low win-loss ratio on those. Okay, 
And then the other thing is folks are going to ask is, well, what about weeklies? Can I trade weeklies? Yes, you can trade weekly credit spreads. Here's the problem with weekly trading credit or credit spreads that I've seen. OK, credit spread, um, um, a weekly option will come out. It's available eight days to expiration. OK. The problem with them is, is you have to put them so close to price to be able to get enough credit to make them worth doing. So close the price that if the stock moves against you even a little bit, you're out of the box and there's no adjustment. You were talking about adjusting or um, things like that in a credit spread. The adjustment is time, right? We know if we have a 30 day expiration and we have a short strike here and the stock pops above that after it's been in a nice run to the upside, we're doing a bear call credit spread here. After a big strong run, the odds are in our favor, right? What's the most common pattern after a big strong run to the upside? A pullback or a consolidation. So the odds would be in our favor of that rest or that pullback. And that's why you want to place these around a resistance level. Stock moves up to that resistance and then bounces away. Okay. So in these trades like this, if we're thinking about logically on how we want to place them, we can have time here on this. And, and the way I normally state it is give yourself some time to be right. On a seven day contract, if it moves against you, you're just pretty much done. There's not much you can do about it. Not much you can do about it. They just, to me, the seven day contract is more of an intraday strategy on the weeklies. You have to go to an intraday chart to manage those a little bit closer. So if you wanna be an intraday trader, the seven, the, the weeklies might be just perfect for you. I've never found them to be very good. And, and the reason is, is the weekly contracts, because of the short time period, they always have higher implied volatility, okay? Which means more potential risk in the move. And you have to be so close to price that it only really has to move against you slightly and you're in trouble on the trade. And then there's really nothing, there's no time left. It's you're either, usually you're right or wrong on the weeklies. Kind of like in a day trade. You're just right or you're wrong. That's all there is. There's no, there's no squishy point in there at all where you can make something out of this trade. Okay. Uh, Nigel, yes, you can certainly go to the CBOE list. But really, I mean, that's only going to show you the, the um, stocks that have lots of volume um, in, in the options trading. And remember, the most important thing on any credit spread is going to be the price action of the chart. So I'm going to tell you, go to the chart. What you're looking for is you're looking for those good, strong resistance levels and trends. You're looking for those good, strong support levels in trends to place these trades. So it's going to be more chart based than it is anything else. Okay. Criteria for exiting on these J Clark is really comes down to um, your profit um, goals in, in a trade. So I get this all of the time where um, a credit spread moves in a direction. Um, you guys saw me do one not that long ago on IWM. I said, I think this is stretched out too high. I'm putting on this credit spread. And I think in three days, I had a 70% return. Well, thank goodness I took the profit, right? I didn't get the full credit on the trade because I closed the position. Here's kind of a rule of thumb, guys. Anybody have a problem with making a 30% return on a trade? Yeah, I would hope not, right? So anytime you get into that 30% range of profit on these trades, it's perfectly okay to close them, okay? If you feel that the strong is directionally moving as better than you expected, 
in the trade, it's also okay to hold them. I have held credit spreads all the way through expiration. Okay, both sides, all the way through expiration because there was virtually zero chance of being attacked. It had moved so well and so strong away, I didn't have any real worry that they were going to come back and attack me. Okay, so it comes down once again, Jay, to the price action of the chart and your confidence in the directional assumption that you have. Okay. Uh, doll, it's right here, and I just explained it. Um, you want to try putting them on 45 days to about 30 days to expiration. Okay. And that's the, this is my rules. Now you don't have to follow these rules. This is my rules. This is what worked for me. This is what helped me build my account. I did lots of credit spreads, okay? Lots of credit spreads. Uh, CJ, um, open interest. It's just like anything else. Do you wanna trade a contract that has nobody trading it? No, you want liquidity in that contract. So is there is there a magic number? No. But I can tell you if there's very low open interest, there's probably going to be high bid ask spreads. You're probably not going to be able to get your one third credit spread. Okay, so just make sure there's sufficient volume in that, sufficient um, liquidity in that trade to make it worth trading. Okay. You know, um, I said this a lot in the um, the three eight trap class that that I recently did because I get that question all the time on, well, what's the per? You know, everybody wants to know, well, what's the magic number for open interest? But let me ask you guys: if you look of all of the trades and all of the options and things that are in the market, and you look at an option contract and it's got twenty five. 25 contracts is the, the total of open interest. Are you going to tell me that you know more about the market than everyone else out there trading the market, that you have an insight into this stock more than anyone else, and only 25 contracts have been traded here? We don't know if that's just one trader that's done that. I can tell you for me, I don't have that kind of hubris that I know more than the rest of the market knows. So if I don't see sufficient open interest in the trade, it's not going to be an option trade for me, okay? It might be a stock trade, but it will not be an option trade if there's not enough open interest there, okay? Because I don't view myself as being better or being able to have insight into a trade or a stock far above anyone else in the market. Okay? Does that make sense? I want a good open interest. Plenty of contracts in there being traded. Okay. Um, bear call, bear call credit spreads. Um, the, the same thing uh, is true here. You have a defined risk and a defined loss, and the same is true. Maximum profit is going to be a premium if received. Maximum loss is the width between strikes minus the premium received, okay? The bear call credit spread are going to be best for shorting stocks with limited risk. Okay, where we have that limited risk because of that position that we've taken. Okay. You want to trade them when you believe the stock is going to be going down. Obviously, it's a two leg. And the opposite um, position would be a call debit spread. We'll talk about those next week. Well, not next week, the week after next. Okay. Now, 
when we construct these trains, everything is about the time. If we look at how theta decays, theta is really, really slow to decay early on in contracts. You know, you have a contract here, it's 120 days out. It has a very low rate of decay in that period of time. But notice what happens to theta in the last 30 minutes, or last 30 minutes, last 30 days of a trade. We get this rapid and extreme parabolic move to the downside in that theta decay. Okay, and that's why I want to be looking for these trades. I want to be looking for these trades. 30 days is kind of my um, thought process on cutoff there, unless it's some big stock with big implied volatility change of some kind. And somewhere between here and that 45 days, that gives me enough time to find these trades and have enough credit in them to make them worth doing, where I can get that one third spread. You get beyond this 30 point and that theta decay starts to drop pretty quickly and it's very, very difficult to get the one third credit spread. Okay? And that's why that rule exists. You just look at that chart right there and see the extreme move and really the last two weeks it just, it becomes very parabolic to the downside because the um, extrinsic value has to be a zero. There's very little time for it to get there, so the decay rate really rapidly increases. Anybody had a credit spread on that had moved against you? Let me give you an example. I was in an Apple credit spread. Okay, In an Apple credit spread, I got into the trade, and that the last day at ex to expiration, the stock gapped, gapped up against me. It was still below my short strike, but in the morning when I looked at the trade, I was down over $1,000 on the trade. It was still below my short strike. And here's the thing, people panic on that, don't they? I'm down a thousand dollars but you don't remember the construction of the trade what's going on the price is still below our short strike we have one day to expiration well by the end of the day all of that loss had turned into my maximum profit at the end of the day just by being patient not panicking because I know, I knew, all of that time value had to be at zero at expiration. And I, had, I went from a great big loss to a nice win just by being understood, standing of the trade and not panicking in the position. I mean, how, how crummy would that feel to have taken a, a loss of over a thousand dollars and then realized, you know, it closed below my short strike. If I had just waited to the end of the day, I'd have had my maximum profit. That's why it really takes some focus and some discipline to trade credit spreads. Okay. If they're both out of the money, JoJo, you don't have to close them. They both expire worthless. Remember, if they're out of the money, you can't be exercised, you won't be in a trade. They're both out of the money. Okay? However, if you're in the money, you're up 30, 40, 50, 60%, and you're worried about a reversal in the stock, close the trade. Take the profit. Okay. You mean on Friday of expiration, T? On Friday of expiration, 
remember options expire on actually expire on Saturday if the close of trading happens on Friday and you your contract is not executable whatever happens past that point doesn't matter but of course if you're in the trade and you still have 20 days left to expiration yes anything that happens after market or pre-market can affect that trade It's an option contract, just like any other. If you were directional on it, aftermarket or pre-market can affect that position, right? So it's going to be the same in a credit spread. What's the deal with that? Oh, 15 minutes after the open? Are you talking about waiting to trade for a little bit until after the open? When we get these big booming, uh, this it really has nothing to do with credit spreads. It just has to do with the market itself and options itself. Anytime, oh, after 4 p.m.? Yeah, after 4 p.m., um, you know, you still have options, um, options um, stop trading. Stock stops trading, but futures continue to trade until 4.15. Okay. Then they resume again at about 6.15. Okay. Futures start trading for the evening. So, or is it? Yeah, I think it's 6.15. So, um... Can they have can that move options around well theoretically the options aren't moving the stock is moving options are tried direct tied directly to the stock so at the market open if the stock moves at the open the options therefore have to move they're tied directly to the underlying stock okay Remember, it's a contract on the stock. So let's take a look here. I don't want to keep you guys here forever, but let's take a look at um, options here. Let's go into a, oops, there we go. That's what I wanted. Um, let's take a look at a potential trade. So if we were looking at, well, um, a lot of folks were talking about Apple or Microsoft. Let's take a look at Apple. Is Apple, whoops, is Apple in an uptrend? Big time, right? Okay, so at any one of these points, once we've confirmed our uptrend right here, we confirmed our uptrend because we held our first higher low. Any subsequent uptrend is an opportunity for a potential bull put credit spread. All we're looking for, and when I say I'm looking for this, this would have been really difficult because of the gap. But when I put on a trade like this, I'm going to try to put my short strike below that support. Even if the stock has to turn around and test support or consolidate here, I have a support level protecting my short strike, right? And if I place my long strike away from there, well, what happened in this trade? It just moved away. This would have been a max winner, okay? You would have had a 100% win on this. What about right here? We continue in our trend, stock pulls back, Buyers step up, we could do a credit spread here, a bullish put credit spread. This would have been a max winner. You may not be able to afford Apple directionally in a call option, but you could certainly trade it here with a credit spread 
and make profits. But you always want to make sure you're utilizing the, t the, the um, technicals of the chart. So for example, if you bought into this trade and everyone's asking, well, where would you be out of this trade? Where do you stop out? Well, on this trade, just like in any other trade, if we break support, do we still have our, is our directional assumption on this trade correct? No, if the price turns and breaks that support, we got a problem here, right? So we close this trade before we come close to that maximum loss. We're still going to lose a little bit of money, but it's going to be a small loss. So all of our trades are based on the price action of the chart. I will not take a credit spread. For example, I see a lot of people make this mistake. The stock moves up here and they take a credit spread where their short strike is right in here. They take that short strike because, hey, I make good profit right there. Yeah, you do. But what happens if all that, all that occurs is the stock reverses to come back and test support again? Now you're under pressure and you run the risk of panicking and closing that trade, even though it might bounce off of that support and come right back up. So make sure you have a good technical pattern that you're trading. Same thing could have been true right here. We're continuing to follow this trend to the upside, right? Things are working out. We've had one winning trade, two winning trades. Could we do another one up here? Possibly. Remember, it all depends on the timing. The timing of the options when these patterns set up. Okay, so could we put that trade on and have one? Yeah, we'd be in a nice profit on this trade. If not already, close the position out. So if you can't trade these bigger stocks, there's your opportunity using credit spreads to be able to do that. Same is true in the down move. Stock breaks down, boom, we break down. We don't do anything in here unless we had an idea in speculation that we thought we might fail here. We have a little high right here and a little lower high right here. It would have been perfectly acceptable, at least in my um, world, to place a bear call credit spread up here on that trade. However, this trade is more of a speculation trade. Would you guys agree? This trade up here, I'm basing it on this little price action and a possible rollover, so it's speculation. I'm gonna trade this trade smaller than I would maybe these trades that are confirmed trends. This is speculating a trend is reversing. This is following a confirmed trend. You guys get, does that make sense? You guys get the difference there? One is more of a hedge, more of a speculation, okay? But when this trade does this, rallies back and we get the failure here, this is no longer a speculation trade, right? We have a lower high. So we can base a credit spread trade here and if have the rule, if it breaks back above that, we're wrong on this trade, so we would close this position to avoid the risk. Okay, so you always wanna base your trades around those good quality positions. Now, a question that comes up often is, you I'm only talking about these monthly spreads, and the question is, can you trade credit spreads on longer-term time frames? You absolutely can. If you look at a stock in a longer-term time frame, could we have taken a longer-term credit spread here? Absolutely. Here's the problem with the longer-term credit spreads. It takes forever for you to see a profit. It can just be like watching grass grow and people get bored with them and they make mistakes. If you want to take a longer term credit spread, it's perfectly acceptable. You can go three months, six months. Just be prepared to wait. OK, 
Okay, the only way you're gonna make your money is when these reach expiration. So you gotta be prepared to wait. So you can place them on longer time frames if that fits you better or you're more comfortable with that. But most people struggle with those with those trades because they are so slow. Okay, they are so slow to perform. All right. Now, when we construct these trades, if we look at, let's go to Apple here. And obviously, Apple is not in a position right now to place a credit spread. But if we were looking at placing a credit spread, you guys know this is what I'm always going to be looking at. If I'm looking for a bear call credit spread, I'm going to come out here. I'm going to look for something near 30 deltas. Okay. This is only a 28 delta. Okay, that might be a little bit of a problem. Oh, and we've got 104 days to expiration. That's not going to work. Here we go. July contracts, 41 days to expiration. So I'm going to come out. Oh, look at there. We got one right at 30 deltas. Okay, that means this option has a 70% probability of still being out of the money, even though this stock is bullish right now. The probability is still this could be out of the money. I would never trade this trade, okay? I'm just showing you how I lay them out. So if I were looking at a bull put credit spread or a bear call credit spread in here, I would be looking to sell this one and I'd be looking to buy this one. It's a $5 wide credit spread. It's $1.38 at the mid price, but look at the natural. The bid ask spread is so wide, I can tell you that there's no chance I'm going to get even close to that $1.38 for credit. I would probably take a $5 wide credit spread that I could get somewhere around $130, $140. Okay. But I doubt that I could even get a dollar. So I pass on that trade. I don't care how good the stock looks. I don't care if I can't trade it with the credit spread to fit my rules. I look for another way to trade it or I don't trade it at all. Okay. Uh, just like I said, Fred, I would not trade this trade. I'm showing you how I look at these trades for a layout. Okay. So if I were looking at a bull put credit spread, that's what I would be doing. If I were looking for a bear call credit spread, I'm going to come over here. I'm going to be pretty close to the same. Because I don't have one that's directly on 30, I'm probably going to favor the lower strike. I'm going to sell this one. I'm going to buy this one. This one does not work either. Okay. My mid price should be around a buck 30 but I'm only at 119 on the mid or on the mid the natural price on the mid chances of me getting filled for anything nearing a one third spread is slim. Now you could decide, hey, 28. Well, what if I go to the 34? Okay, you can certainly do that. There's nothing particularly wrong with doing that other than you have to recognize the fact that you're taking more risk. If you have a 34 delta, What's your risk of this being in the money, guys? You're taking a higher risk trade. The closer you go to the money, the probability of it being in the money goes up. Okay. So it's okay if you want to do that, but you've got to have some pretty strong confidence in that position that gives you some cushion. And then you guys are always going to see me do this. So on this trade, I'm going to look here and I'm saying I'm shorting the uh, 320. I'm buying the 315 in this trade. So what I'm going to be doing is I'm always going to come over to my chart and I'm going to lay it out on the chart. There's the 320. This is my short strike. Now, does that look like I have much cushion in that trade? In fact, wouldn't you say I'm placing that trade right at support? 
Would it be out of the question for this stock to just turn around and test that support? So chances of me taking this trade, slim and none. Because I'm not giving myself any cushion. If I could get that cushion where I'm down maybe a little bit further down below this area, okay, then I will take that trade because if the stock pulls back and tests support in here, I'm okay and bounces off. So can you guys see there's kind of an art to doing these? into doing doing them correctly it's about the timing and direction it's about making sure you're collecting enough on those trades to make it worthwhile doing for the risk and it's really being respectful of support resistance and trend in the chart being very cognizant of where those levels are so, for example, if I had a short strike that was down here on this trade, I'd probably do something like this. You guys have seen me do this before. I would say if I close below right in here, close below there, I have to close this credit spread trade. Because if I'm right in here, I run the risk of breaking that support and then just continuing this down move. Okay, and then I'm in really in trouble if I don't close this position. The last piece that I wanna talk about here this morning is the importance of the condition, the market condition. Okay, we know that the market ran up ex to an extreme level this week, right? In that extreme run up, do you think there's a high probability of a pullback? Yeah, so we get a stream run up. We have a high probability of pullback. I've got about 45 days to expiration here, right? So would it be possible that we could get Apple to pull back and then bounce right off of that level? And we could maybe still get that credit spread. Yeah, it's being patient and waiting for the trade to set up as you want it to be. Not speculating so much around that trade or rushing into it. Make the chart do what you want it to do. And be patient. If the trade never lays out, don't worry about it. Move on. Okay. Now, one of the best ways of finding good credit spreads is just in your list of trending stocks. Okay, if you know what stocks are moving and trending, you know, we've been talking about these trades all along. Okay, could Intel have been a bull put credit spread on any one of these lows where we bounce off of here? Notice that support level held. That's why we want our short strike below those support levels because we can go into these bouncy periods, but it's okay. We still profit as long as the stock stays above our short strike. This support level in here, moving higher, is it possible that we could have taken a credit spread in here on this trade and be underneath that support? Okay, so we're gonna be moving with the trend. We have to be respectful of the price action of the trend. Shake Shack, Shake Shack had a really nice test of support here. Tested that support, buyer stepped in. We could do a credit spread here, right? How about a double bottom? Well, it's a lot more speculation because we have no trend here. But I do know a lot of folks that like using those double bottoms for credit spreads. The problem with it is, is it really requires you to predict the direction. Okay, but is it doable here? Yes, but you have to be more of, I'm predicting this is gonna go up from here because we don't know. This could come up, turn around and continue the downtrend, right?
So it requires more of that prediction. I kind of tend to avoid those. Um, I want the higher probability trade. I always want the higher probability trade. So I'm going to be looking for those stocks that are trending, giving these, these good quality signals and maybe saying, hey, at any one of these points, as long as the timing is right, the setup is right, and I'm following this trend, there's an opportunity for a credit spread. Okay, cool, cool. Making some sense? Awesome, awesome. Now, let me just one last quick thing here I forgot I wanted to do. If I were to take this credit spread right here, you, I told you that 28, and this credit right here, if I move this to the Analyze tab, And by the way, I really do want to encourage everyone out there to get more involved in, um, in understanding um, these trades, okay? Understanding um, the setup for these trades. So one of the best things that you can do is get over here on the Analyze tab and analyze this position. This is a bull put credit spread. We know that that profile, because we looked at that profile, is just like that, right? So we have that profile in the trade. This little red hash mark right here is our break even point, right there. That is our break even point in the trade at expiration. If the stock is here at expiration, we break even on the position. So anything above right here, that line is our credit. Okay, anything below this line is our potential loss to here, okay? Make sense? That's our potential loss. So in this position, our current price of the stock is right here. That means that any time the stock moves up, we have a potential of our maximum profit. If the stock goes sideways and stays right here, we have a potential for our maximum profit. If the stock pulls back slightly, we have the potential for our maximum profit at expiration. Okay, so the stock has that movement that gives us our maximum potential profit in the trade. By utilizing this, you can visualize the trade a little bit better. You can see that, for example, if we entered this trade and suddenly, and I mean within a week of buying this trade, Apple is back down here, you're under attack on this trade, you probably should be closing this position, right? you're still gonna have close to 30 days left on expiration and it's showing us a bad problem here. We close that trade. If we're within five days of expiration and the stock is right here, should we be as worried about this position? No, that's right, because theta is really working in our favor in that situation. The decay rate is really, really fast so we don't have to worry about it so much. So it's all about the timing, right? Making sure that we're placing those trades correctly in timing. Now there was a question early on about maybe changing one of these trades up, how you could manipulate one of these trades to uh, do a little bit better. And here's what I'm gonna tell you on these guys is you wanna get in here and practice. You wanna get in here and practice. Practice different ways, um, things that are going on, how you might be able to modify this trade. What you're gonna find is it can be very, very difficult to come out of a credit spread trade that's really against you. You can end up spending so much time and energy on that trade trying to um, work yourself into an even position that it's, 
it's almost not worth it. The better thing to do is close the trade when you're wrong and then find a new trade, right? That starts working for you. Don't fight with a bad trade trying to make it a good trade. That's right. Just get out of it. You were wrong. Fess up. I was wrong. Move on. Find a chart that's working better for you. Okay. But there are things that you can do. You can, you can add butterflies to these trades. That gets really deep in the weeds. <laughs> you can add butterflies to these trades to improve your profitability. You could add a directional trade. You know, um, it's going against us that we're in a bull put spread. It's going against us and we could add a put trade. Helps to hedge the position, right? We can do all kinds of things to make modifications, but I can tell you guys, oftentimes it's better to just say, I was wrong, close the trade before it costs you much money, look for another position. All right. Good stuff. All right, all right, good. So think about those trades. Um, by the way, if we go here to probability analysis on this trade, probability analysis, and you want to spend some time, I can't explain this to you today. Um, this, could, this could be a class in itself. But the probability analysis on this trade is going to tell you because we have a 28 delta, the probability analysis on this trade is we have about a 70% probability that our assumption on the direction of this trade is correct. Okay. So get in there and practice. Get in there, turn on your paper trade, and put credit spreads on. Don't worry about winning. At first, what I want you to do is put on credit spreads, set them all different places around the market, different things, see how they react, see how they move, see how they profit, see how you and you can learn to manage them. Then start working on getting a little bit more precise on your entries, managing those trades to a profit, making sure that you're paying attention. But first, just kind of get used to putting them on, feeling them out, see how they move, how they work. And then pretty soon you'll just you'll be an expert credit spread trader. This it isn't rocket science. I know it seems kind of um, complex initially, but doesn't anything seem complex the first time you try it? You know, I always use the analogy of of a um, manual transmission vehicle. How many of you know how to drive a manual transmission vehicle? learned how to do it yeah and when you first learned how to do it it was almost overwhelming wasn't it i mean i got three pedals here two feet and i need to steer and shift at the same time right it's overwhelming but you never give up on that because you want to drive, right? And pretty soon, within a couple of weeks, you're driving down the road, singing to the radio, eating a sandwich, and drinking a Coke all at the same time. And it's like, it's, it becomes natural. That's what practice does. If you get over here and practice this, it becomes natural. Okay, you don't even think of, have to think much about it anymore. You want to be focused, but you don't have to think about it because you understand the mechanics and how to put them together, and you've done enough of them that it's just a repeat of the same trade. So practice, practice, practice. Get in here and put those on. Don't be afraid of losing. Don't be afraid of a bad trade. Nobody's going to care. They won't care, you know, in your paper trade account that you lost money. But if you learn from that, how they move, how they work, you can make really good money with credit spreads. Okay?
All right, guys. I want to say thanks for y'all being here today. Hope you got something out of this presentation. Hope it made some sense to you. Picked up some good info. Oops. I exited that. Picked up some good info. You guys are welcome. So I will, um, I'm going to go ahead and end this recording. But guys, you might want to look um, on the YouTube channel. I'm going to try and get a couple videos posted to the YouTube channel this, this weekend. Um, this one will be over there as soon as I can get it ready to go. Okay? Thanks, everyone. Have a great Saturday. I appreciate you being here so much. And feel free to ask questions at any time on credit spreads. I'm more than happy to answer them.